to you live from the great low felt in Juma and Arethusa game reserves in the Sabi Sands, the greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. As if you take in that sunrise for a moment. The views don't get much better than they do out here, particularly during the sunrise and the sunset. Awesome. My name is Jamie. I have Brian on camera with me this morning. Out as well on Wendy will be James and Viam. We've got, as always, an exciting morning planned for you all. Don't forget to send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions on wildearth.tv. And with no further ado, let us head out and see what wonders of the bush we can find to show you. And on this, International Women's Day for us, although we haven't quite got there for most of the other time zones just yet. We will be doing a special show this afternoon that will focus on all of our lovely female animals. So start thinking of your questions now and whether you have any inspirational woman that you'd like to tell us a story about. Not just that, ladies out there, if you want to send us through your requests, we are happy to hear from you what animals you would like to see on your special show this afternoon. And I think it's safe to say that our hyenas and our elephants will be playing a large role. But at the start of International Women's Day, let's see if we can figure out where those Nkuhuma lionesses have gone off to. We know that they, or we suspect that they were somewhere on the property yesterday. I searched high and low, James searched high and low, and somehow they managed to escape us or evade us. I'm not sure if they're not sitting in the middle of a block somewhere with a kill. That remains to be discovered. And of course, as with every early morning, there is that wondrous sense of excitement of coming out into the bush first thing in the morning. It's my favorite time to be out. It's the best time to be out. Getting up before the sunrise is when all of the exciting stuff tends to happen. Now, there's one thing I want to show you. I'm going to do a little bit of a loop as I wait for the sun to start to come up, peek up over the horizon so that we've got a little bit more light. And then I'm going to tell you a story about how my morning started for the third day in a row. And we shall go and investigate the scene of the crime. I know James is wandering around on quarantine. His plan is to look for any sign of the Inkahumas coming out of that block. They were very vocal yesterday morning, but not a peep from them this morning. If they do have a kill, they're going to be moving between it and water, or would have moved between it and water. We've got uh, it's hyena tracks. It seems to be hyena tracks everywhere around Juma. Our clan is doing spectacularly well. But yes, the lionesses would be moving backwards and forwards to water. And the closest water source to where we think they are would either be Juba Pan. My door is open. There we go. Now, just to go back quickly to the final moments of our sunset safari, we had a spectacular bush baby sighting and then carried on a little bit down the road and discovered a night jar sitting in the road. And Marilyn just wanted to make sure that she got the name right or that the identity that I gave was correct and that it was a fiery necked night jar. Yes, Marilyn, it was definitely a fiery necked night jar. When it bent its head forward, we could see a little bit of that fiery neck that gives us its name. And I'll actually, when it's a little bit lighter, bless you, Brian. I'm also sneezing this morning. I will show you a picture of the different night jars and you can have a look at how incredibly difficult it is to identify the different ones. And I've actually got a really cool story 
about a night jar that I'm going to tell you about in a moment. But I'm going to wait a little bit for it to get slightly lighter. Already it is 26 degrees centigrade, so 79 degrees Fahrenheit. It feels genuinely cool, to be completely honest, for us, having got so used to the high temperatures we've been experiencing. And apparently the temperatures are predicted to skyrocket up to 40 degrees centigrade, which is well over 100 degrees Fahrenheit this afternoon. So we're going to be... Um, yesterday we were melting. I'm not sure what's going to happen this afternoon. Oh, goodness me. As both to take the easier way around. This is actually what I'm on my way to show you. Just remember to report that. I keep forgetting. And we report it to one of the Juma staff and they come along with chainsaws. Obviously we'll move them where we can, but that's a knob thorn tree. Uh, oh no, it's not actually, it's a buffalo thorn. Either way, I don't really want to tangle with it. I've already had enough trouble with a silver cluster leaf. I don't plan on adding buffalo thorn to that list. So we move the ones that we can, but where we can't, we just ask the guys to come and remove them for us. And I should actually put up some pictures of some of the trees that I have removed in my time giant marula trees, tying them onto the back of vehicles, sawing through with bow saws, with hand saws rather than chain saws. Can be a hugely enjoyable form of exercise when you're sent out to clear a road. Right, so where we are on our way to, and I'm actually double checking very carefully for the culprit, is to the driveway of Ingers, which is where myself and where Scott and Nikki used to live and where Eugene lives. So hopefully we don't discover poor old Eugene in his pajamas. Let's go and investigate and you can have a look at what I encountered this morning. This is minor in comparison to the last two mornings where we actually couldn't get out of the driveway. But we were paid a now regular, I think I can turn that off now, it's light enough, on our regular three nights in a row nightly visit from an elephant. Now I've nicknamed him Asbo. I do so purely as a joke. It's not in any way serious. He's not a problem elephant, he's not a difficult elephant. He's just doing what animals do in a drought, which is to try and come into people's gardens. I'm hoping he doesn't try and drink from our swimming pool, although I think he's more intelligent than that. Let's just do a quick investigation. He's come through this way. His tracks have moved off in that direction. Now we've been, you have to excuse the slight mess, we've been redoing the roof. So that is why it's looking a bit shabby. We are in the process of clearing it. Here's the start of his mess, driving through. So this, this is what I woke up to this morning. This is all going to be cleared today. It's just been put there last night. This morning when I woke up, now my bedroom sits off to the right there, my bedroom window, and that is what I woke up to this morning. But he was actually standing between where I had parked the Mahindra and then between that and the Bucky. Uh, Mr. Asbo strikes once again. He'd actually set off this motion sensored light. Oh, when you come out in the darkness and are faced with one very large elephant, luckily I was listening for him already because I had a feeling that he was going to be around. I just walked out, we had a very gentle conversation. It wasn't about shooing him out, it was just about tapping my leg very gently and saying, come on boy, it's time for you to move out. And he looked at me for a while, we, we had a bit of a, a sort of moment where we stared at each other and then he turned around and he walked straight back out the gate. The reason why we're not shutting the gate at the moment is because when we tried that, he walked straight over the fence. Uh, we apparently have a regular inhabitant of Ingers that has decided to move in. 
And speaking about male elephants, I was going to go and look for him, but it seems as though Mr. Hendry has found one already. So let's jump on the back of his vehicle and have a look. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this, the International Day of Women. Unfortunately, we've only managed to find you a male elephant here, a young male. And just before I continue with my treatise on this young male elephant, I must introduce myself. My name is James Henry. I am, unfortunately, for the course of this day, a man. I'm being um, filmed by another man, Vian Dorenbrach. We're not very large men, though. We're both quite small. And I must just say that, of course, to the ladies in final control, it is not South African, it is not South African Women's Day. No, no, that is on the 8th of August. For the rest of the world, happy Women's Day. There is an elephant. Now, you are, of course, on a live safari, as Jamie told you. And... That means we do want you to talk to us, so please ask us questions, send us your comments. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. Uh, for those of you who are men out there, uh, you are still allowed to ask us questions today, fear not. But the afternoon drive will certainly be skewed towards questions of female conservation and, um, well, the feminine, of course, which, as we know throughout history, has been somewhat dampened by the insecurity of the male version of the human species. So do send us through your questions about those sorts of things. Uh, matriarchal societies, of course, elephants, hyenas. We'll probably try and find both during the course of the afternoon. Very important day, this. Now, there's a... We saw these two young bulls here yesterday, and there is a herd just to the south of them, which is basically to the right-hand side of your screen. They're feeding through the woodland, and we can just hear them snapping branches, the odd kind of very low ultrasonic rumble. So I think there are quite a few of them in here. These two young bulls will just be hanging on the fringes. They're the most astonishingly wonderful elephant sighting yesterday, I suspect with members of the same herd, although he's quite distinctive with his missing tusks, so it might not have been the same group. But I had an elephant cow giving herself a dust bath just two meters away from the vehicle. She covered me in dust, and it was just a wonderful experience. She showed no signs of anger or aggression or threat. And so it was a totally comfortable, profound experience. You think this elephant has decided he doesn't want to be filmed anymore, Bill? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right, oh, well, what about the one coming up the road then? Do you think he wants to be filmed? So that's part of the herd. Looks like another young bull probably also hanging on the fringes. And just while we wait for him, let's see if he'll come all the way to us. There's a beautiful bird calling to the right-hand side or to the western side of the vehicle, and it is a grey-headed bushrike, and it's just stopped calling, unfortunately. But it has got the most lovely sort of plaintive whistle giving rise, VM, to its Afrikaans name of... Spookful. Spookful, which means ghost bird. It does sound quite ghostly. No, don't come off the road. He's just walked off the road there. Michael, very nice question. You want to know how long an elephant's tusks can get. Um, Michael, as you probably know, they're very varied, so some bulls will have no tusks. Some bulls will have little tusks about that large. And then some bulls, the big ones that were in the Kruger, would be taller than you, even. And they'd probably weigh more than you as well. So I think the biggest, I'm not sure what the, the mass was, 
or the weight was, but certainly sometimes the tusks will reach the ground. And you can actually see when they walk, you can see grooves in the ground where if they haven't lifted their heads up, their tusks drag along the ground. So if they can get that big. That's very unusual though. So I don't think we're likely to see an elephant out here like that. I've seen one elephant bull with enormous tusks that they didn't face down towards the ground, but they were certainly probably about, let's say they were about five feet long once they'd come out of his jaws. So that's enormously long, but they went straight out in front of him like that. Five feet, just over sort of one and a half meters, I suppose. Here's this chap here, and he's also a young bull. I think he's going to move into this little space here. There we go. It's very kind of him. Not so much. You can hear how subdued the dawn chorus is. It really is like half the orchestra has gone on holiday. One or two first violins in place of the forktail drongos. A little bit of woodwind from the orioles. A couple of piccolos, the one or two southern gray hornbills calling in the background. Entire brass section seems to be on strike. normally be played, of course, by the ground hornbill. Hello, Linda. Uh, you were watching yesterday, and we had an incredible sighting of two elephant bulls having a fight with each other. And they were young bulls, probably about 20 years old each, and I suggested that they would probably be eventually thrown out of the herd by the matriarch who wouldn't tolerate the noise and rambunctious behavior that they were engaging in. And you want to know if they have been thrown out. Uh, Linda, I don't know, but I would suggest that it's a period over which that sort of separation from the herd occurs. So they rejoined the herd yesterday, but it's clear that they are becoming too old to be there. And the matriarch will slowly start to push them out. It doesn't happen, I don't think, in a sort of get out of the house and don't come back manner. It's a sort of slow separation where they too will feel a sense of independence, like this one is from the rest of the herd that is behind him. We can't see them, but we can hear them. And one or two incidents where the matriarch will give him a hiding and tell him to disappear. But it isn't something that happens suddenly. It's devouring that tree. That is a red bush willow, is it? Yeah, um, I think it's also this. Yes, it is a red bush willow. But you can see he spat it out. Did you see that? There's a huge amount of tannin in those leaves, and he spat them out. Uh, this is a very good question from Kathy in Tennessee, and it's an important one, and it's an important one that I need to keep reevaluating for myself all the time. What signs are there that an elephant is uncomfortable you, with you when you're too close? So how is the elephant going to tell you that you're too close? Well, Kathy, the first thing, let's use yesterday as, as an example. I'm not sure if you saw it, but she approached us. She walked past us. She was in a clearing. It wasn't like we were in any way hampering her ability to move. So she walked towards us in a manner that was not threatening. So she didn't open her ears out at all. She had her ears closed and she was just feeding. She was definitely watching us and she was trying to sort of smell us every so often. I'm going to reverse because the sun's about to pop up over the horizon while I talk to you, you Kathy. Um, so that would be an obvious one. Ears out, an elephant opens its ears out like that and shakes its head. It's saying, you're in my space, please get out of it. And then they might do something like exhibit what we call displacement behavior, which is where they pretend to do something. So they might pretend to feed, and you can see them watching you out of the corner of their eyes, and then they'll pretend to feed, and they'll pick a piece of leaf, they'll break a little branch off, put it in the mouth, and you can see them drop it then on the ground. They don't actually start chewing. 
they might rock onto one leg and lift one leg up and kind of turn it over like that and that's the sort of indication that they're just not comfortable and so when that happens you need to evaluate will the situation die down or do you need to to get out of the way so that to just diffuse the situation and yesterday that elephant did nothing of this like that but just before we had that incredible elephant sighting we found that bull that Scott had had the incident with a few days ago and he definitely displayed I wouldn't say discomfort but certainly a certain um, and I hate to use the word aggression but there was a sense of aggression about him and he he opened his ears out and he flopped his trunk over his tusks how's that Liam? that work for you? he flopped his trunk over his tusks and he came loping towards us in a very typical what we call musk swagger or must swagger and that was an indication that we should move out so it does take a bit of time, Kathy. So, I mean, sometimes now I feel like I can tell pretty quickly, but certainly it's taken a lot of time for me to learn how to tell when an elephant is comfortable and when they're saying, please, would you leave me alone? Now, I think the sun's about to pop up over the horizon. Graham, do you think we are a bit early? I rather early than late. Yes, better early than late, because, of course, you can't ask the sun to reset itself. Yeah, I think that's a rather pretty picture. You can see the glowing ball. We are staring down the barrel, people, of a 42-degree day. That's 106 degrees Fahrenheit. At the moment, a very pleasant temperature, probably about 22-odd. VM even has a jersey on. Apparently it's 26. Not sure I believe that. And that's 79 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm not convinced that I believe that particular um, reading from our weather station. Maybe there's just a slightly cool breeze. Anyway, then hopefully tomorrow a little bit of precipitation will help us to tie us over during the course of this drought. Come on, sun, peep up. Here it comes. Here it comes. It is amazing to watch how the horizon lightens so quickly. It changes every second. And the soft, soft light that we can see now, because of the cloud and a little, and the fact that the sun is below the horizon, is going to change rapidly. And so we're sitting probably close to six o'clock now. By the time that sun has reached 15 minutes or 20 minutes above the horizon, the light will already have gone a fairly sort of washed out white color. And that's what it's going to be for the rest of the day. That's because there isn't any cloud in the sky or very little to diffuse what it's going to be a bright sun. See, this, <laughs> this thing is uh, being distinctly uncooperative, I feel. Mm. Here it comes. Maybe it got stuck. Maybe it got stuck, yes. I just don't want to move because I, I I don't know why I have this fascination with if you have a chance to see it pop up over the horizon then you should oh there it is there it is Phew. let's be quiet for a second just have a listen Imagine the Earth turning slowly towards the sun. That's why the sun's coming up. And imagine how fast that is happening. Millions of miles away that sun is. And without it, none of this incredible life around us, this great abundance of biodiversity would be remotely possible. bird. Hmm. Perfect. Right. 
Let's head across to Jamie. I'm sure that she too is reveling in the sunrise and we'll head to the south to see what else we can find. James read my mind in that respect. I was just on my way to the south in that case. We shall change our route plan and go left. And I think the reason both James and myself are thinking about going south is because of that buffalo herd that was on Juma yesterday. What I'm gonna do, I just remembered I was gonna, I promised Marilyn I would show the difference. I'm just gonna grab my book for a second on this spectacular morning. And just look for Nightjar quickly. There you go. Oh, we're doing a Scottish accent on the Game Drive channel today. Hold on a second, James. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Hendry. I'm going to take Central all the way to Chitakatlan. Copy that. Okay, so James and I are just discussing our route plan and where we're planning on going so that we don't end up exploring the same place. This is the night jar that we saw yesterday evening with the slight fiery, you can see where the name comes from, they describe it as a rufous collar but a fiery neck, essentially. One of the most beautiful calls. Unfortunately, I haven't managed to get the bird app on my new phone just yet. Otherwise, I would play the call to you. It's almost impossible for me to imitate. But you can just have a look at all the different night jars that you can get. These are not ones you'd find in our area, but just look at how similar they are. If we go across to ones that we might get, for example, the Eurasian night jar, There's one of them, and some more, all very similar style birds. And I'm sure this is, uh, do one more. This is the Mozambique or the square-tailed nightjar, also with a bit of a red neck, but slightly larger. And a slightly a square tail. Oh, that's wonderful news. So Marilyn is saying that she, this was a new bird for her list. I'm thrilled to hear it. Right, so if you're looking at fiery necked versus square tailed, sorry, just thinking about it, the other difference is there is slightly more in the way of white on the wings, from what we could see, and white tips along the secondary feathers. That is how sort of complex identifying individual night jars starts to get. Really interesting. And one thing, the story that I wanted to show you should be on the last page of my book, and that is number five. That is the Nisha, Nishisa nightjar, and it exists only as one sample of one wing. That is all anybody has ever seen of it. Right up towards Ethiopia and Eritrea, and there's absolutely nothing known about it. And Brent and myself have just purchased a book about this particular nightjar, so I'll keep you updated on the story that it tells. Essentially, it threw the ornithological world into absolute chaos in terms of deciding whether or not it was a new species. It was just the sample of the wing was clearly a night jar, but too different from any of the other species in that area. Nobody could work out. It obviously had was a very controversial decision to, lame, to name it as an individual species, since it was just the sample of one wing that was found in a road. So it sounds like a very interesting read. I think that Brent's got it at the moment. It's me. Given the speed that he reads at, it should be done in the next sort of four hours. And I'll be able to keep you updated on that particular story. Now I wonder if I could request James, since I know that he has the birding app that I wish I had on my phone. I really must get around to putting it back on. Since I got a new phone, I've been fumbling around with these technological things. But if James could maybe at some point play for you the call of a fiery neck tonight, Jar, it's one of my favorite summer sounds. What's fascinating to me is that I've actually 
have barely heard it this summer. And I don't know whether it's because I've just be come to a different area and they don't call as frequently here, or whether it has something to do with the drought and maybe a slightly more limited breeding season that they've experienced. A sound to me that epitomizes a summer evening in the bush. to, I was on my way south, but I am going to continue on to the east. And on the subject of birds, Keith was wondering whether grey-crowned cranes ever come across to Juma. Keith, no, not as far as I know. I think we would all be very, very much surprised if that were to occur. They're further to the north and to the west of us. should do. I don't think I'm, I'm not going to try and drive through this bit and flick through the index of my bird book. Sorry, Keith, but I'll get a distribution map up for you. That being said, every now and again, if you look at a distribution map in a bird book, for some of the species, every now and again, you'll get these funny little X's. And what that essentially means is that that type of bird was seen in that area maybe once, maybe twice, a very, very rare thing. Happens commonly with migratory or um, oceanic birds. So things like albatross that spend most of their time on the wing, if they get caught up in a storm or some kind of wind front that blows them in the direction of a new area, they might suddenly appear there. And they get recorded if it's confirmed by the ornithological societies and they will be recorded as having been seen there once or twice. And in South Africa, when that occurs, and I'm sure throughout the world, I imagine, it's not just a South African thing, but there is a mass influx of twitchers or bird watchers, and they will travel hundreds of kilometers to see, for example, a tiny little thrush in a Johannesburg garden to see the Egyptian vulture that a couple of years ago decided to pay the Kruger National Park a visit. So to say that we would never ever see one of those cranes here, there's no absolutes. I would say it was pretty much unlikely, highly unlikely, but nothing is impossible. Might decide that that is the place it wants to be. James is right about the dawn chorus. I noticed it when we started the show, because I was going to start pointing out all of the individual bird calls as we watched the sunrise, and I realized that not much was singing. I wonder if they're not preparing for the skyrocketing temperatures that we're going to experience today. The animals seem to be seeking refuge as well. They're all hidden far away. time, I think. Just to help shade my eyes, make spotting animals easier. There's no sign of the Inkahumas coming across in this direction. It's a bit peculiar. I wonder where on earth those lionesses vanished to. The only thing I can suggest is that we missed their tracks somewhere along the line and that they'd actually crossed out of Duma. I think by now the vultures and the birds of prey would have discovered. Oh, beautiful. Amber was just thinking about the same thing Brian and I were discussing. So Amber was saying, why are there never any cheetahs on the drives? She watches all the time and never sees them. Amber, there are cheetahs on the drive, but they tend to be fairly rare appearances. The last time I saw a cheetah was just after I started working here around July, August. And the most recent cheetah sighting was a couple of weeks ago when I was on leave. And in fact, Brent was sitting out on quarantine with Nikki on a termite mound, and the cheetah came running past on quarantine, which he then spoke to me on the phone and made me very jealous of that particular sighting. 
Amber, there's a couple of reasons. One is that it's going to be the best view. Let's see if we can get a view of this wall. Sorry, Amber, see you in a second. Let's see if this is gonna keep displaying. Come on, do the full, do the full dance for us. They do this wonderful lifted wing rocking motion. Here we go, here we go. Oh, that was very half-hearted Hornbill. One more time, give it a good go. Oh, lazy start to the morning. <laughs> very half-hearted. But at least we saw a portion of it. Their bonding call and display. And those pair bonds between hornbill males and females so incredibly strong. Oh, almost. You can hear the other one calling somewhere. Nope. <laughs> All right. Well, it was worth sitting to see if it would do it properly. Still a little bit of the, of the proper display. Listen, Hornbill, if you do it now, now that we're about to move on... <laughs> I thought so. Right, sorry for the brief interruption of the yellow-billed Hornbill. Definitely not a new one for most of you in your bird list. You just did it. <laughs> You cheeky hornball. Right, sorry, back to Amber's question about cheetah. A couple of reasons. Cheetah cover enormous distances up. Sorry, Amber, you'll have to wait once, once more. Here's the male and the female together. Ah. Well, that was actually a beautiful picture in silhouette. Bye, guys. Live wildlife. You can never plan what they're going to do to you. Right, third time lucky, Amber, sorry. So, we don't see cheetah because they cover enormous distances, as I said now. And when I say enormous distances, their home ranges, for example, the two males that we occasionally see, go right up into the Manuleti, which is about, they probably cover in a straight line a distance of about 20 kilometers, 10 miles in a day if they wish to. So, they need nice big stretches, and the reason they do is because they are very much in competition with lions and leopards. In terms of the predator hierarchy, the cheetah sits right at the bottom. In terms of top five, lions, hyenas, wild dogs, close together, leopards and cheetah. And where you have areas of lie high in density, as we do in this area, and we're very close to, or fairly close to Satara in the Kruger Park, which of course we are open to without fences. And that is the liest, highest, not the liest lion, the highest lion density in the world. So it is a difficult environment. It's also not quite the right habitat for them. It's a little bit too dense, too closed. They prefer slightly more open areas. They also like to move around on the crests of hills as well, funnily enough. That being said, should our uh, traverse um, extend, as is in the pipeline, we will be, there's a very good chance we will have more regular cheetah sightings, which I think all of us are feeling particularly excited about. Most of us really enjoy cheetahs. Of course we do. And imagine that we'll be able to build up to the point of being able to build an individual character and a story in the same way that we know our lionesses or our leopards. That's going to be incredibly special. So Amber, watch this space. Things are changing and hopefully with it will come more of the different kind of spotted cats. Right, let us find out what Mr. Henry has been up to with his morning. 
Monkey, monkey, a primate, can't tell if it's masculine or feminine, looks like a young male to me, unfortunately. Anyway, he's still quite enthusiastic and quite uh, enjoyable. Sitting there as he is, basking in the new sun. He clearly does not have the weather report, because if he did, he would be hiding from the great golden orb that has just popped up over the horizon. He's quite itchy. I don't know where the rest of his troop is. I mean, it's quite unusual to find him on his own, and it's, I suppose, another indication that he's a young male, because he is on his own, and they will disperse to other troops of monkeys. Oh, there's another one, look, if you're on the, on the marula here. He was just hiding there. There we go. They do very much rely on each other for safety very sharp eyes and ears and highly complex communication. Well, highly complex vocal communication, much more so than many of the other animals out here. <laughs> that one, wishing he was bipedal. Now, it's an interesting thing that if you watch, I don't know if he'll do it again, but he stood up, obviously, on his back feet a bit like a human being would. The ability to stand on two feet is not a simple thing. It's not a question of doing what that monkey did, which was basically rear up onto his back feet. The whole pelvis of a human being is shifted. So where that monkey is, it's shifted backwards on the spine. And that means that you can balance and you can bear the weight on just your front, on the pelvis, and then on the back legs, which are essentially our legs. And for that monkey to stand up, it's obviously going to rock back onto the pelvis, and it's, it's not sustainable. While they can actually move like that, it's totally unsustainable, very tiring, and puts huge strain on the joints. And so it was quite an evolutionary step for our ancient ancestors to move from the quadrupedal or four-legged locomotion to the bipedal or two-legged locomotion. There are a few more of these monkeys in the marula tree here. There's another one up there, Vyumpi. Now, Felicity on YouTube, a very good question, and I, I think the answer is no. You want to know if they hoard food. No, they don't, you know. I think they forage for what there is. I think they need fresh food. And the only animal that I know of out here that hoards food for any length of time is a squirrel. And, you, and surprisingly, I mean, they do that all over the world, do squirrels. So a tree squirrel will make a little stash of marula nuts. A leopard might actually make a few kills and stash them, but obviously that won't be for long. But monkeys, no, I don't think they do. They're not territorial at all, so they don't ever stay in the same... Well, I mean, they will sometimes stay in the same place, but they're not always in the same place by any means. So it's not like they have a den that they go back to or a necessarily a regular roosting point that they'll go back to. Look how incredibly agile they are. Oh, that's wonderful. That's a female. Now, just the strength, just the strength to be able to do what that monkey's doing, to hold itself, to hold its whole mass like that sideways on a tree is astonishing. Look at it sneaking out there. You see how the pelvis is situated much further forward. That's a really cool monkey sighting. We, we very seldom have good ones like that. They normally stick their heads behind the trees and that's the end of that. Good. Very nice. Come on, Wendy. On we go. YouTube. Here, 
we have a mystery. As James makes his way back towards signal issues or signal areas, let's have a look here. See if you can figure out what has occurred. All the way along the road, one massive mark. The interesting thing is, hmm, I'll tell you where we are. We are exactly at the junction of Central and Drakensberg. So for our regular viewers who've been following the story from day, or are able to follow the story from day to day, this is exactly where Mr. Hendry found that dead art fark in this block here. We had about 40 plus vultures in the area. I've just been, I just looked quickly. It doesn't look like they've, they've decided to leave. And obviously, when I went on my walk yesterday, I must have missed it because I actually thought that most of it was gone, but they probably moved it slightly, which is why I didn't find it. But the hyenas have been by and they have found it and dragged it along the road. It, it's always an important thing to remember that you shouldn't make an automatic assumption just because you know something's happened there. But if it were a leopard kill, which would be the only thing that would make, other thing that would make a drag mark like this, we would see leopard tracks. Those of you who've seen the way that leopards drag their kills, they do it with feet on either side and with, their, with the sort of the kill between them. And they lift it up with their heads up like that. So you always get the leopard tracks moving along like that. In this case, I can't see any hyena tracks. And I think that's because it was dragging backwards. So dragging over where its feet were falling. It doesn't help that this is not fresh, fresh because it means that other animals have walked over where there might have been a track to see. Now, how do I know that it's not fresh, fresh? Oh, I'll show you in a moment. Also, trying to figure out a direction that the track goes in. I'm just going to hop out for a second and tangle myself. Oh, goodness. I'm going to attempt to untangle myself. Oh. So, the direction that it was going in was actually almost, it's not always that easy with drag marks, but it was actually really clear in this instance because it's dragged it through a little bit of an ant mound here. And it's pushed this, you can see how very clearly it's pushed the darker color soil in that direction. If you don't have evidence like that, then you usually look for little rocks and stones or other things that would have been disturbed and have a look at which direction they've been dragged along in. The other reason why I know that it's not fresh, fresh, is two. One is that there is a track sitting in the middle here over the drag mark, and that is a hippo track. Can you see it from there, Brian? Mm -hmm. Thank you. The hippo track here, one, two, three, four tone. That is the best outline of a hippo track I think I've ever done. Beautiful. It's like a child's drawing. Heading off in that direction, hippo, of course, know their habits, they move around at night. And there's one other reason that I say that, but I'm not sure. Yeah, we'll try and look for one closer. Yeah, we've gone out in about Will you be able to show them this, Brian? Yeah. Perfect, thank you. So these little conical pits, most of our regular viewers will have been familiar with. They belong to antlion larvae. And these pits have already been reformed by the larvae themselves after the carcass was dragged over the top of them. I'm just, I was ever so delicately touching the sides to try and see if they would come out. It, it takes them a, a little while to rebuild the pits, not a huge amount of time, but it does take them a little bit of time to rebuild after the sand has been disrupted in there. So what they do is they build a cone-like pit and the animal sits at the bottom with incredibly sharp mandibles and waits for something like an ant to fall in there. So all of these little clues lead me to the conclusion that it is not a leopard kill drag mark. That combined with the fact that we know that there was a dead art fark in this area. It would also play a role for one second, if you bear with me, just to show you what an antlion larvae looks like because they are fascinating. And lions 174. This is 
more for new viewers that might be joining us for the first time. He's funny, there you go. There's a picture of the funny little conical pits. And then if I turn here, we should get a really nice picture of, oh, where's a good example? There we go, perfect. Remember I said they've got these savage little mandibles. You can see what I'm talking about here. So a creature that, this is obviously a magnified picture, a creature that's probably about the size of my thumbnail or smaller and it waits in lure of its victims. And then it looks, at some point it will metamorphosize into one of these. And that some point can be up to about 12 years before it forms the adult version, at which point it will come out, mate, and die within about 24 hours. Very beautiful in their adult form, less so in their juvenile, slightly sinister looking pupil phase. Here we go. So that is what we were looking at. Those little conical pits. All important, no matter what your level of interest may be in the small creepy crawlies, all important in terms of aging a track like that. I'm going to leave it. I'm not going to follow up. If, now interestingly, if I didn't know about that art bar, there's a chance that I might have been fooled into following it back. And I could probably, there's, even though we're about, at a rough guess, two, maybe over two k's away from the hyena den, since it's moved, it's a bit further away, I could end up following that drag mark all the way back there. And a hyena could decide to drag it all the way back if, interestingly enough, it's a high-ranking female. Now, only high-ranking females get the dubious honor of being able to drag food back to the den. Lower-ranking females will have to take their cubs to it. And those interesting little intricacies of why it's better to be higher-ranking. really good question from Walt about our antlion pits and the fact that they are different sizes and he was wondering why they are different sizes and is it to do with the different sizes of the larvae and Walt I have to be completely honest I don't I'm not a hundred percent certain I would go with yes that's what I've always assumed to be the case but as with everything assumption is a dangerous thing but to me it makes sense the only other option that I could suggest plays a factor or plays a role in the size of the conical pits is the substrate soil that it is made in. So certain soils are sandier than others and that can be in the, the most minuscule of distances, if that makes sense. Some have just got more grainy soil, some finer soil. So in the finer soil ones, the walls have to be slightly less steep or else the ant lion would be constantly excavating to push it out. I'm going to continue on my search, but James has found a brand new baby impala. Let's have a look. Uh, in theory, James has found a brand new impala. Unfortunately, sorry guys, just let me listen to the Game Drive channel. Uh, sorry, is that the one? They're talking about the hyena den. Never mind, I thought they had a sighting on Aubrey's Road. Sorry, so James has just gone black screen temporarily. I'm sure he'll be up and running as quickly as possible. So that's very late. That is what we in South Africa would call a lot lamaki, which pretty much speaks for itself. It's a late, late lamb. What would, I'm sure there must be a Western it must be a Western term, but I've never thought about that before. We call it a light lamaki automatically. Um, essentially, and we'd refer to it whether it's in a, a sheep context or it's a late lamb, or in a human context. You can say to somebody who's had a child at quite an older age that it was a light lamaki, or when they've got a big gap, age gap between their siblings. A lamb being a lamb, and then any Afrikaans word that you add a key sound to, 
automatically becomes diminutive. So a large, late, lummocky little lamb. Now typically impala do have two, two birthing seasons. The main one, end of November towards December. And then there is a second one, and that's because no matter how effective a reproductive system, not every mating is going to result in fertilization. It's impossible to have a 100% success rate. So for the years that their first time mating is not successful, they then have to come back into estrus again, which they do about a month and a half later. And you get that second minor rut after the rutting period in May, June. And as a result, there are some late lambs born typically around February. I'm quite surprised that we're still seeing little ones. I, I'm uncertain as to whether or not the drought has played a role in it because I very strongly question the idea that impala can delay their own birth. I do not think it's possible, personally, to physically do that. Hello, water bath in the morning light. Aren't you beautiful? I thought I caught a whiff. One of the few animals that if you really wanted to, you could actually track by smell. Even with my blocked nose. That fluffy coat comes with its own unique odor. Very stocky and solid in comparison to something like the graceful kudu. <laughs> Stopping to look individually down the road. It's amazing. Every single one of them has stopped to look down that road. It's important. They've got in increased visibility down that way. And as they disappear behind the bushes, Let's finally jump onto the back of James's vehicle and have a look at what he's found. We'll jump slowly, everybody, because these birds will fly away if you leap onto the back of the vehicle here. The two Wahlbergs, Mr. and Mrs. W, giving each other a bit of a aloe preen, mutually preening each other's feathers, and that's because they're about to go back into equatorial Africa for the course of our winter and their summer. I think it's a really good idea. I mean, uh, I suppose it would be quite nice to go to Europe for the summertime, but nice to go into a different part of Africa. And that's what the Wahlbergs does. We actually know very little about their northern ranges. And I think they go all the way from Senegal in the northwest of Africa, and I think all the way across a broad band just south of the Sahara. And the Sahara Desert and the, I mean, any kind of desert region or thickly forested region are often what we call an environmental barrier to migrations because it does mean that you then have to make a very long crossing. And the Wahlbergs just avoid that by not going over the Sahara. That's quite an interesting couple because they are both pale form. That's not entirely usual. The pale form is not the most common form, and yet here at, at Juma, we've got at least three. And the two adults there, and they always come back to the same tree, so we can identify which ones they are. And then further down this road, which is Twin Dams Road, we've got another couple uh, with a dark form and a pale form, and they've got a nest there. And then I've seen another pale form up on Drakensberger Road. And the most common form is supposed to be the dark or brown morph which we don't really get that very often here. Now, I'm sorry about our signal. This has been very poor indeed. And I think I was answering a question when you were last with me. And I'm going to ask Geraldine to ask me again. Ah, yes, from Brian in Seattle about how monkeys thermoregulate. How do they regulate their temperature? Brian, in much the same way that you and I do. There are a whole lot more of them, actually, at the pan there. But before we go and look at them, let's just quickly look at this beautiful virtual starling. So they are mammals, of course, monkeys. And so they do sweat a bit. Uh, not all monkeys, at least all mammals will sweat, but monkeys can sweat. They will also drink water in the same way that we do. And if it gets really hot, they'll get into the water and then they'll sit in the shade. Now being small, of course, means that they can radiate heat quite quickly. 
So if they're in the shade and they're not in direct sunlight where they will heat up much more quickly than a, a bigger animal, they will be able to lose heat. So that's how they manage to get by with a thick coating of fur despite the heat. Now that bird, the virtual starling, is sharpening his beak there. Cleaning it off and sharpening it must be kept in a good state. Otherwise, crucially, it won't be able to eat. Isn't it wonderful? Look at the color on that thing. And of course, as I've said recently, I've been trying to understand the method of how birds are able to have the coloration they do. There's no pigment in that bird. It's all a trick of the light. There are plates of keratin and plates of melanin interspersed with bits of air that create, that absorb various wavelengths of light and then reflect others. And so that bird has got no blue and no purple and no green pigment in it. It's just a trick of the light, a really clever arrangement of keratin and melanin within the feathers, and I think it's just absolutely brilliant. That's why you don't see the colors unless they're in good light. Mm. Very clever indeed. Let us continue. Wisconsin, a nice one. Um, what is the most common bird in this area? Hmm. Maybe the Cape Turtle Dove. I, I think uh, probably the most number of Cape Turtle Doves. I suppose if we had a great flush of red-billed quilias, they would immediately become the most numerous birds. They are apparently the most numerous birds in the world. That is the red-billed quilia. Look at this kingfisher here again. Kingfisher sitting so perfectly, and they too will be flying into a very similar area than the Wahlbergs. And if I'm not mistaken, they've started over, just over the last week to quieten down a bit. And that means they will be too will be thinking about heading north, but not just yet, please. We do enjoy having you with us. Isn't he wonderful? And those of you who are in Australia, I know that there are a few people that live in Australia that watch the show. That is a close relative of your kookaburra. Kookaburra is much bigger. The woodland kingfish is probably only about mm, seven or eight inches long. And the kookaburra is probably twice that size. Kookaburra are ginormous. Mm, they're enormous, aren't they? Have you seen one? Yeah. Have you? Yeah. Where did you see a kookaburra? Uh, south, south side of Australia. South side of Australia. Like that big. <laughs> I'd love to see a kookaburra. Kookaburra. So named, I think, for the name and the noise they make. I think it's an onomatopoeic name. Now you can see the light has washed out already from that very gentle golden sort of reddish hue. It's already turned to white. And it's going to get whiter and whiter and whiter as International Women's Day merges into the cookathon of the low felt. I'd love to say that cookathon was my own word, but it is not. It is Brian's. Look, look, look. Oh, little bird, why did you fly away? It was a lilac breasted roller. Ah, now you wanted to know the call of the night jar, the fiery neck night jar. I have set it up on my telephone here for you. Jamie didn't have the Roberts bird app. Here we go. This is the litany bird, the fiery neck night jar. Huh? No, that's not a fiery neck night jar at all. That most certainly is not a fiery neck night jar. Stop. Back. Fiery necked. Hang on one second. That was a freckled night jar. Crashing. Oh. Hey, we're crashing. We're crashing, says VM. You notice how he didn't panic, he just said we're crashing. We're crashing. We're crashing. 
There we go. Isn't that a beautiful call? And Jamie is absolutely correct. For me too, it is the perfect soundtrack to a summer's evening in the wilderness. Let's go up here. Every day we drive around, and if I'm not driving with Brian, um, it's almost like a trick to see where he's left his tripod for time lapse. He's become slightly obsessed, I'd say, with taking time lapses of the clouds and the sun and the various things that go on here. And so you'll pop around a corner, and there will be his tripod points pointing in one direction, taking 8,000 photographs at a time for a time lapse. Now, this is quite interesting. There's a giant flock of starlings. And I say giant, not this particular group, but there's an enormous group behind there as well. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, at least sort of maybe 30 birds. Now, it's not uncommon for starlings to flock like this in mixed flocks. This is a mixed flock. There's a Birchall's there, and there are a couple of either greater blue-eared or Cape Glossies. And it's not unusual for them to flock in winter. But for them to flock at this time of the year is strange, and I'm pretty sure, again, it's because of the strange kind of winter landscape that we have here. Hmm. Yeah, end of winter time, it's quite common to find them flocking, but not now. Hello, G.I. Jane, <laughs> you're on YouTube. Wonderful film, that, G.I. Jane. Um, G.I. Jane, you want to know if we've seen the Batalia lately? Yes, we have. We, I suspect quite strongly that once the heat starts to build, they'll take off and we'll be able to see one later, latterly today. So if I find a Batalia or see one thinking about flying away, I will tell you immediately. But yes, they're not in protected areas, they're pretty common. In unprotected areas, they're not. So in some unprotected areas, you will find birds that are unusual or interesting. I mean, in some farmland areas, you'll have eagles and vultures. But battaliers tend to only survive in protected areas. I don't know really why that is. Not much going on on quarantine. Just about everything has run for the shade already. So what we are going to start to do is focus on the water. See where, see what is coming down to drink. I've had no tracks of any cat today, unfortunately. It's very irksome. Where on earth the Inkahuma pride disappeared to during the course of yesterday, I don't know. But what we will do is get onto the boundary with Arethusa and see if there isn't an update from them as to whether the Inkahuma pride hasn't crossed there. I've been spending quite a lot of time on Simbambili of late. Which is the reserve to the northwest of us. I just want to show you something quite... Well, I'm not sure how interesting it is. Will you show us the can, the tin can there? <laughs> now, one of the big things, if you own a game reserve, of course, is that you want it to look nice. and. One of the things that people find difficult to look at is if elephants push all their big trees over. So on the clearing here, there are a number of large knobthorn trees that have these <laughs> tin cans on them. And the tin cans are filled with creosote. And apparently, this is a <laughs> method of deterring the elephants from pushing these particular trees over. So a number of the big trees around quarantine are blessed of little cans full of creosote, which apparently is very smelly to an elephant, and they therefore won't push over your tree. I'm not convinced of the method's efficacy at this stage, but let's see as the drought continues whether the tin canned ones live longer than the, than the, than the uncanned ones. Hello, 
Iggy, this is very nice. Thank you very much. You're from Canada, and you say that you read today that they will be opening some of the natural water holes in the ephemeral rivers in the southern Kruger in order to help the animals out with the drought. First of all, you can't open a natural water hole. Um, it's either a natural water hole is either there or it isn't. But what I suspect they mean is that they will pump water. They will start to pump water in areas where in a normal year there might be pans. And you want to know what I think of that idea. Do I think it's good or bad? Um, Iggy, I think that it's an interesting one because I suspect that there would be more water were it not for the agriculture upstream. So to provide a bit of water for the animals is possibly not necessarily bad. I don't think it's necessarily um, creating a situation that wouldn't be there anyway were it not for the people that are sucking water out of the out of the rivers for mining and for agriculture upstream. So in that, from that respect, I don't think it's bad. I do think it's bad. However, if it gets to the stage that areas start to become overgrazed completely around the water, and that's an important one, because once the water returns and once the rains come back, you want to make sure that the landscape can recover, and it won't recover if there hasn't been sufficient die-off of the herbivores. So, you know, it's a bit of a catch-22. The guys in the Kruger, I think, far more now than they did last time. I think they do have a pretty good idea of what to do. And of course, they're imperative while they are conservation. I'm with James on that front. I'm not entirely sure that those tin cans are going to work. The other method that some people do employ in terms of keeping elephants away from trees, and I've seen it in certain areas, is for the big trees on open clearings like that, they pack rocks around them. So essentially just making it a little bit uncomfortable for the elephants to walk across and to try and feed on them. Also doesn't always work. When an elephant wants to eat, it wants to eat. Interesting amount of destruction though that's been that's occurred on quarantine around our fireside chat spot. I stopped there yesterday next to all of the silver cluster leaves and to me it looks as though it was more like an elephant had a little bit of a temper tantrum more than anything else. I'm just gonna check this mark in the road. Sometimes when a vehicle gets a twig or something stuck underneath it, it drags along. Leaves, hold on, mark. There's lion tracks coming up this road. Interesting. I'm not sure if we can see them there. I haven't positioned us exactly perfectly, but there they are, wandering right next to the side of the vehicle. Big male lion tracks. So, one of the Birmingham boys decided to pay us a visit last night. Just to give you a perspective of size and how I know it's a male. It's about the size, it's, it's bigger than my hand is. So there's a significant size difference between a male's front track, roughly that big, to a male's uh, to a female's front track, which is about that big. And the fact that also that he's on his own. Hmm. Morning just got potentially exciting. Let us see if there's not a male lion resting somewhere on Ledwood Road. It would be interesting. I'm not convinced in my own mind exactly how fresh these are. But you never know. I just don't think anybody's driven along Leadwood this morning. Now the three Birmingham, three of the Birmingham boys were on Cheetah Plains yesterday where they've been spending an inordinate amount of time. Hello Piggy Winkles. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Don't worry, we're all fine. Female and two youngsters, and what 
looks like, yes, two females and two youngsters. And this is generally the area where we've seen the, the warthog, the skinny warthog, who's obviously not well at all. But this is not her. I must say, the warthogs have been doing fairly well this season, which surprises me because they tend to be quite sensitive to drought. I'm happy to say that a lot of, we're seeing a lot of youngsters reaching, or at least getting past that initial scary moment for baby warthogs. Those first few months are so risky. The female wandering around. Hello. Yes, we're looking at you with your little cheek tufts, meant to look like tusks. You're not fooling anyone. Look at the one with the mohawk on the left. <laughs> That's a little male. And as soon as warthogs get a little bit of a fright, <laughs> they do what's known as pilo erection. Same as the way the male and Yana do. And it's to make themselves look big and scary. And I don't know about you guys. I don't know about you, Brian. I'm pretty intimidated by that mohawk. Mm, me too. That is one mean little warthog baby. <laughs> Little punk rocker. You can pop it down now, little one. It's okay. All is fine. All is well. So if we can catch them as they move into that open clearing. <laughs> little bit skittish. I would be too if a male lion had walked past. That wasn't, they didn't actually get a fright because of us. I th or at least not large, I think it's largely because they're feeling a bit nervous. If that lion did walk through here, oh, it's one of those, it's that funny change of season weather where you can't quite decide if it's hot or cold. I think I'm hot now. Okay, little warties, they've moved off into some very dense bush, so I'm going to carry on away from them. And we spoke, we've got an example there of two females and two youngsters, and most likely the two youngsters belong to one of those females. And it's very common, and we spoke about this before, for warthogs to form little sounders little families. Quite often it's a mother and daughter and their youngsters, but it can be unrelated females as well. Just checking that these lion tracks are still on this road, which they are. Just trying to gauge freshness. I don't think James or myself drove here yesterday. And the zebra and so on have walked on top of them, but they do still have that minty glow of a fresh track. I'm walking all the way along here. Keep your eyes peeled, you never know, we might spot a Birmingham boy. But yes, we chatted yesterday about the warthogs and their families and the possibility that if that sick mother's, if that sick mother does die, whether or not her piglets would ever be adopted. And I said that I didn't think so. They wouldn't be adopted into another sounder, but they've got a little sounder right there that they could potentially move into. I think it's highly unlikely, but as with anything out here, you never say never. Now I'm looking for a nice, clear example of these lion's tracks, and then I can answer Simon's question fairly clearly. nice and clear. So Simon was wondering, is it possible to identify an animal's gender by their tracks? And if so, can we teach, teach you guys how to do that? And this is a really nice, clear example. So I'm going to jump out quickly. I'm just going to show you. Male lions versus female lions is a relatively easy one. Gets a bit trickier with other animals. I'm just going to grab a drawing stick. Looking at this one, Brian. Yeah. 
take my shadow out of the way. Let's give you a bit of perspective as to the scale. So if I were to hold my hand like a lion's paw, a male's track, and this is very clearly a male's track, is much, much larger. So if I draw around the outline very carefully, there you go, the round front foot, and the elliptical back foot, you get a sort of a rough idea as to scale. Now, if I were to just show you how the track differs in terms of a female. First of all, let's look at the back lobes because they're nice and clear, at least in this back track. The one, two, three lobes that immediately tells us it is a big cat wandering through in this direction. A female's track would fall inside the boundary like this. So there's not much difference in the shape of them Although I tend to, I don't know if it's my imagination. So a female's track would essentially cover an area of about that size. So I don't know if you, how clearly you can see the sort of the internal circle versus the external circle. That would be female versus male. In lines, it's fairly clear. I, I always think that female tracks are slightly neater. Their toes are a bit more close together. But that's not always the case. In this case, the toes have spread out slightly because it's very soft sand. It's sort of, it's very pliable. Now, to me, these are nice and fresh. It'd be worth calling them in on the Game Drive channel, which I am going to do. But I imagine they're going to be part of the Birmingham boy. I'm gonna check whether there's been any sightings of them this morning. A uh, lion moving off in that direction. Now, Simon, that's, that's a sort of a partial answer to the question that you've asked. And what I'd love to do is find a leopard track to be able to show you. That size difference between female and le male leopards is even more pronounced in that case. And there's, the female track is at least about half the size of a male track. There's also an, a slight difference in the, the angle of the back pad, but that I will have to show you on the track itself. So that's predatory cats. It gets a little bit more tricky with something like, let's say, a hyena. Yes, we know the females are bigger. So a big, big track is likely to be a, is likely to be a female, but that doesn't work when you've got sub-adults. They're all the same size. It's next to impossible to tell the gender from those sorts of tracks. And then there's certain antelope species. So most of the time, the male antelope will be larger than the female tricky to tell. Something like an impala, it's almost impossible to tell, but then something like a wildebeest, the back track of a male will be, instead of the nice, sharp, pointed, typical hoof shape, will actually be rubbed fairly smooth along the tips, and that's because they have what are known as interdigital or pedal glands between the two halves of the hoof, and they use those, they scrape their feet more regularly than females do, and as a result, they start to wear down the front part of the track. And there's lots of different techniques. And remember, of course, that when you are tracking, you're not necessarily just looking at the footprint of the animal. You're looking at a lot of different aspects. So you combine that with the idea that a male wildebeest is less likely to be, or a female, let's put it this way around, a female wildebeest is much less likely to be on her own moving through an area, whereas a male wildebeest has a set territory, he's got middens, he's got places where he goes and he rubs his head against trees, where he scrapes his feet to put his scent all over his territory. Simon, there are lots of different techniques. The place where it gets tricky with all animals is the young. As soon as you add youth into the equation, so it's not fully sexually mature, you get to the stage that you actually, it actually becomes more tricky. Uh, I'm just wondering, that the lions cut off the road <coughs> into the block off to my left, as far as I can tell. I just want to see that he hasn't cut the corner which animals fairly typically do. They're happy to walk on roads until the road doesn't really make sense, at which point they just take the shortest route. Before I do... Ah, 
as always on Ledwood Road or around Ledwood, between Ledwood and Batalier, we come across these striking birds. That is one of probably the most striking bird of prey with its bright orange face and its distinctive black and white. A batalier. Also one of the few that you can tell the difference between the males and the females. There's a very clear sexual dimorphism. And just have a look at the way that the wings extend past the tail. Oh, well, there we go. <laughs> this is for G.I. Jane, who wanted us to find a batalier for her. There you go, G.I. Jane, with pleasure. And in this morning light, it doesn't really get more beautiful than that. Surveying the land. And G.I. Jane, and for new viewers, there is a local myth about the batalier, and that is that the batalier was either, depending on which one you read, either the embodiment of the creator of the earth or a, the first animal ever created. And it watched the first sunrise on the earth and it will be watching the final sunset when we come reach the end of the earth's time. And that is a local myth or a local legend about a battalion. And you can see why with that coloring, how it inspires myths and stories. As far as I know, thought to be very good luck as well. And that short, short, distinctive tail, or well, actually, at the, from this angle, barely existent tail. You can just see the tips of the wings extending below the branch. Very fluffy head. At this angle, it's quite difficult for me to tell if it is a male or a female. We know that there is a mated pair on this road, along with their juvenile youngster. So one that still has his fluffy brown coloring. It'll take him between seven to eight years to reach the full adult plumage. I'm having a good scratch there. But I'm not sure at this angle whether it is a male or a female. The females have more white. They have a secondary band of white along their primary wing feathers. And in flight, it is when that color difference is most distinctive with females having an almost entirely white wing, whereas males having a combination of white and black. And just since we're here, I will find a picture for you. For new viewers that would like to become budding birders, I think perhaps the index was a good idea. Beautiful, striking bird. G.I. Jane, hope you're still watching. Hope you're enjoying it. Your batalier sighting. Here we go. The difference between the males and the females, that's the secondary band of white I was talking about on the female that the males lack. And then in flight, that almost entirely white underwing base with males, the half black and half white. And then the funny brown poor, poor juvenile that got the short end of the stick and has to wait until it becomes the metamorphos metamorphizes into the stunning adult it will become. Very pretty birds. Let's just head across just a bit further to this corner and see if there is any sign of these lion tracks popping out here. Or has it cut the corner through here? that I showed you before. Safari Dean's been listening intently to our tracking lessons and I wonder, 
sorry, I got distracted. Um, I saw traps of animals running earlier, and I triple checked around, and I couldn't work out why, but I wonder whether it wasn't the presence of that lion. But Safari Dean's been listening to our tracking lessons and was wondering the track that we were looking at with the back foot and the front foot being so close together, does that mean the animal was running or walking slowly? And the answer is that he was walking a little, he was striding, he was striding with purpose, if I can use that as a way of describing the speed. If he was strolling, so that if you picture, let's say, the Inkahuma lionesses walking down the road and sighting, for example, the sighting we had at Bifflesook Dam when we first watched them walk away from us onto Cheetah Cut Line, that steady walk, walk, walk that they do, back foot falls pretty much on top of the front foot. In this case, the back foot had extended ever so slightly past the front track, so he is purposefully walking, maybe not quite striding, I'm getting into the complex nitty gritty here, but he was, he was definitely on a mission. I know that the Birmingham boys have been moving between Torchwood and Chitwa, oh sorry, and Cheetah Plains. But what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to take Cheetah Cutline and just see if he hasn't cut across somewhere here. going into the complex nitty gritties. Matthew in Los Angeles was wondering, how does the season affect the intricacies of tracking and the patterns and the movements that we see? The most obvious way that I'll go into is rain. As soon as it starts to rain, if the soil gets a little bit compacted, our lives get very tricky in terms, in, in terms of tracking. Not just because the tracks are harder to see in the road, but also because there's far more groundwater. So a lot of the time we try and put ourselves into the mind of the animal and work out where we think it's going to go from where it is. And most of the time those calculations will, at some point, will guess at the possibility of them going for a drink or, in the case of lions, possibly going to target a waterhole as a hunting ground. These are assumptions, but that's really all you can do with track. Some of tracking is educated guesswork. Then, that will also, as I said, affect the substrate or the soil type. At the moment, in the middle of the drought, tracking for us or seeing the tracks is fairly easy. Staying with them, of course, is a totally different story. There's far less grass around. Uh, if we equate this to winter, which is essentially what we're dealing with, we're basically in a dry season when we should be in our wet season. There's less grass cover and there's more sand exposed. So even when tracking through a block, it becomes easier for us to spot where the tracks have fallen. Easier is, it's all, it's all relative, not necessarily always the case. Beyond that, I cannot think of any major seasonal differences, apart from, of course, the fact that animals are going to be traveling fairly regular walkways to water. And those game paths might become more and more apparent. And when I talk about a game path, in the case of elephant paths or hippo paths, those can almost look like man-made hiking trails, regularly used pathways that are an easy way for the animals to move through the bush. Those will become more and more distinctive as the dry season draws further in. I think his tracks have popped out here. I'm going to act on a hunch and go and check up on Buffles Hook Dam. If there's no sign of him there, then I'll return to the last tracks and go for a walk in that block. in Konzo for Medora 1, Medora and Gala, mobile northeast along Ledwood and then cutting north into the block about halfway along that road. Let's just see if there's any response. If Taxon or Aubrey is listening, they might decide they might let me know if there have been any sightings on Torchwood. 
So Tortred is the property to the east of us, just across our eastern boundary. Driving right along the boundary road. And that's where the Birmingham boys have been spending a lot of their time. For lions at the moment, and in terms of tracking lions, the prides have not shown much in the way of a tendency to move terribly far. Less so, less true with the Inkahumas, but more so with the Telemates. Because if you can sit at a waterhole and wait for the animals to come to you, well, then why not? Well, I go looking when you can quite happily sit and wait for dinner to be delivered. The other thing, to return to the seasonal tracking question, the one other difference that you might see is that certain species might start to move out of an area and into a different area. And for us, it's fortunate because we've got an influx of elephant, we've got quite a few buffalo herds moving through at the moment, all coming in from that eastern section to the east of Torchwood, which is on the Kruger boundary. And I've driven through that section of Kruger recently. It is unbelievably dry, but not just dry. There are places for the animals to drink, but it's just lacking in food. The animals have grazed and browsed it flat, and it means that they're pushed and moving into our region. Apparently, James has been for a little stroll in the morning light. Let us find out what he has been up to. Hello, everybody. Um, yes, stroll for in the morning light, certainly. A morning uh, wielding torch coming out of the east, more accurate. There's some lion tracks on the road here, male, which I shall attempt to show you if I find a clear one and a female, but they don't look fresh to me, which makes me think, wonder. Here, we'll probably get a decent view here. I just don't know how, I just, I know that VM and I think Jamie and VM drove this road yesterday. So I'm a bit confused. Right, let's have a look, see. Here, um, VM P, can you see here? Yeah, I'll do. Here's the female track. Looks like a fairly large male leopard track, basically. That's not a big female track at all. And I wonder if that isn't the missing Inkahuma lioness. And by missing, I mean the one consorting with the Birminghams at the moment. Then I'll try and find you a male, substantially larger. Here he is here. In fact, here's a better one. No, that's her. They've swapped. This is a male here. Now, that Birmingham boy that I think she's with, that scar-faced Birmingham male, is, he's not very big. So, I mean, his, his, his track is just a little bit smaller than my hand. A big male track will be as big as my hand is. In fact, probably slightly bigger. And they're not very large. And I remember seeing the Birmingham boys for the first time on the cheetah cut line and thinking to myself, um, yes, well, they're male lions, certainly, but they're not very large. And I thought that the Matimbas, therefore, which were and are big lions, would give them a run for their money, but they didn't. They scrap it off. Okay, let's just go forward here. What I want to do is go into the clearing and just turn around there, just see if there's anything in there, and then we might try and follow these a bit more closely. They are, like I say, not don't look particularly fresh. Now, I'd be interested to know, you know, whether Jamie was following tracks of a male and a female, or just a male, or what she was following there, the other side on Ledwood Road. So I'll just find out if Jerry will tell me. So Jerry says that she only had a male there, so it's quite, quite possible that this male could easily have gone that far. But she's not wild, she is the other side of the reserve, it's not a very large reserve. So here we are in the clearing, where there is nothing, and then there was some impala alarm calling around about the power lines and quarantine clearings. Steph heard them, and we, Viam and I went there, and we did a thorough investigation of the area, didn't find any tracks there either. So we're going to just do an about turn in the clearing once we've had a look at that bird over there, the kivit, or crowned lapwing. There you can hear him giving his Afrikaans onomatopoeic name, kivit. And 
and they are ideally suited to this kind of weather. They will run around here eating insects, catching bits and pieces, and then they don't need to drink. They're completely water independent, so they're perfect for a drought situation like this. And they manage that because they have evolved from the plovers, and the plovers are normally shorebirds, and the shorebirds have got to get rid of a lot of salt, obviously, because the water in the sea is full of salt, as everybody knows. And if you didn't know that, um, well, I think we can do. And so the plover has got very sophisticated um, salt glands just above the nose, and they can excrete huge amounts of salt. And it's a really good way of making sure that they don't desiccate, they don't ever have to drink, which I think is really clever means they can spend all their time looking for food and socializing with each other. And then over there, some Senegal lapwings. A whole nice flock of them. I'll just go around the corner here, then. You might get a better view of them. And then we're going to turn around, just trying to see where those lion tracks came from. It looks like they came from down here, in Arethusa. So there is... But right on the western boundary, everybody, right on the Arethusa boundary, there is a Senegal lapwing. Not a particularly great picture of him, but he too is a very similar coursing bird, will run around the clearings here trying to catch insects, devour them, and they, I don't think, have the same salt glands, but they'll have some kind of clever mechanism for dealing with salt, because they are also evolved from the same common ancestor as the plovers. In fact, they even used to be called plovers. Right. We're going to go straight down this road. We're going to continue down what we call Finn's Road. We think this lion may have headed off in that direction. And it could have been, I mean, to me, these tracks look, they look old enough to have been from yesterday. But there have been lots of elephants walking up and down this road, and so that will confuse the issue, sort of picking up sand, throwing sand, walking over the tracks. So difficult to tell whether they're actually from last night or if they are perhaps from, from yesterday. Anyway, let's go and see. It really is, it's astonishing how quickly the heat has built around here now. So we started off apparently at 26 degrees. I think we're probably at 30 already. And we're barely, we don't think we're at half past six in the morning yet. Half past seven, sorry. Which of course is very early still for lots of people. And apparently the weather station says it's 28 degrees. So it is building. And that's 82 in Fahrenheit. 82 degrees Fahrenheit, half past seven in the morning. I always remember that. That's a good one if you if you are ever having to swap between imperial and metric. Eighty-two is twenty-eight. Dan in Pittsburgh, you want to know what the relative humidity is at the moment? Um, I've got no idea at the moment. I think it's probably about thirty to forty percent. We can find that out from our little weather station. We'll get that information through to you now. Apparently it's 64, so that's quite high. 64% humidity. So it's not, I mean, while it is hot, it is a normally dry heat. It's not like, I remember I spent a bit of time in Chennai once, which is in India, on the east, southeastern coast of India. And that is a new level. That's this temperature with 100% uh, with humidity. And it is a state of discomfort that unless you are used to it, uh, you can't conceive of it. I don't know how those people get on with their lives during the heat of the day there in Chennai. Fascinating place, but good grief. Not comfortable if you're not used to those sorts of conditions. Now, the lion tracks came down here. They went off the road somewhere, but because of the elephant activity, I can't actually tell where. So we're going to go to the junction here with the big Badanite tree or big torchwood tree and see if we can see them again there. And if not, well, we'll just continue our search with fortitude and stoicism. Shan't we, Vian? 
plenty of... You didn't listen to that. That's all right. You can just say yes every time I speak. That's fine. It makes my, my ego swell. Now, the lion tracks are not on the road here anymore, but there are plenty of hyena tracks. So let's have a look around the junction here. Lots of sand. Sand, of course, is very good if you're tracking. There are a couple of elephants. There are lots of impala, some diker, one or two hyenas. And more hyenas. Excuse the bump. Sorry for not looking you in the eye, everyone. I just need to keep an eye on the road here. But the lion did not come this way. Right, we're going to turn the edge of the drainage here. Not the edge of the junction, sorry. Come back up. on Twitter, you want to know the difference between a striped and a spotted hyena track. Um, Simon, I don't have any pictures of tracks, but what I will do is try and find you a... a sorry, spotted and brown hyena tracks. Um, oh, dear. If I find another spotted hyena track, I will so, show it to you. But the difference is not large. The difference is basically uh, size. They are very similar-looking tracks. Probably slightly different shapes. I've actually never seen a brown eye in a track. But they're very similarly sort of shaped. With a kidney-shaped outer toe and sort of uneven, squashed up arrangement of pads. We'll try and find you a very fresh one. Lots of hyenas walk around at night. Of course, that immediately that I actually want to show you a track, you won't see another one. Let's have a look here at the junction. No, <laughs> no. Simon, you won't believe it, but there are no more hyena tracks here. I think the ones that we had, I've driven over. Come on, VM. Can you see a hyena track anywhere? We've seen hundreds of the things. You have to look for leopard tracks. Yes, look for leopard tracks and you will see hyena tracks. Yeah, let's continue up here, Simon. I'll keep having a look. We can listen out for some alarm calls. We've had some squirrels alarm calling, but that alarm calling bunch of impala that Steph heard, I has, could find no sign of. Right. While we continue our little search here, Jamie's got something much more interesting and little to show you. So continuing on my search for the lion tracks, but I got distracted by this little adorable bundle of fluff <laughs> nibbling away. Tiny little baby in Yala. Already, as we chat about with all of the antelope species on solid food, eating solid food, despite the fact that it's only probably about, I would say, maybe a month and a half, two, they grow incredibly rapidly. <laughs> Nibbling away. They are terribly sweet at this age. You can really see the fluffy tail developing. With this shock of white underneath. It's all right, little one. It's okay. A bit more nervous than the adults, picking its way delicately 
through the thick vegetation. It always amazes me the way that Nyala can do that. Oh, had a little tremor there. Must be the flies. Always amazes me the way that Nyala can wander through an area like this without seeming to ever trip or knock themselves or scratch themselves. They've just got such a good awareness of the space around them, which is very useful when you're adapted to dashing and ducking and diving through thick drainage line systems <clears throat> and riverine areas. Interestingly with Nyala, it's not a species that we would see if, if we were to go back many, many years in this area. They were actually introduced here. So it is an indigenous species to South Africa and there's a couple of indigenous populations up towards the northern Kruger. But they were actually introduced to the southern sections of Kruger and reserves such as the Sabi Sands. And they've just been phenomenally successful. Particularly here, I've never seen the Nyala herds in the same way I have in this area. Nimble little lips tugging away at the leaves. We're going to, the wonderful thing about these live safaris is that for all of the animal species, we can actually monitor exactly how the drought affects them. So it's not like you're coming on safari for a couple of days and then have to go home again. You can watch for months at a time and we'll get to observe patterns of behavior that probably haven't been fully seen since the last enormous drought in the early 90s. And Safari Dean was wondering on that subject whether or not because of the drought, the animals start, might start targeting trees that they might not normally eat and that they don't necessarily enjoy. And I would say that that is a possibility. Animals tend to be far less fussy than we as people are. They do have their preferences and obviously those preferences won't be able to hold out completely. Luckily, all antelope species are evolved to utilize a wide range of browsing resources. There are lots of different tree species that they will munch on. But yes, I think to an extent we will see eating habits that we haven't necessarily witnessed before. Maybe more of them munching on, for example, guari bushes, which tend to show considerable resilience. They often grow in areas in those wide open sodic patches that, or just around sodic patches. Got a fright. She suddenly realized how far away mom was. Love it when little ones do that. But yes, Safari Dean, we will be observing different patterns of feeding and maybe targeting plants that they don't necessarily like, or in, in the reason that they don't like them is they're not as palatable. But as I was saying, guari bushes, yes, they will start tar targeting them more and more. We've noticed, we spoke before about the fact that there's a reason that lions urinate or territorial mark on guari bushes. And one of the reasons is that quite a few of the animal species don't enjoy munching on them. The other reason is that they maintain their green leafy foliage all year round. So, but I've seen giraffe eat them. Oh, there's another baby in yarn. I didn't see that one. You're also getting left behind, little one. Not quite as young as the baby we were looking at. There's a certain roundness to the faces when they're little. And we will have a chance to observe different patterns and we'll be able to build up a picture in our own minds through pure observation rather than just something that we've read about in theory or in, pa on, in scientific papers. We'll be able to build up our own picture of how the animals cope with the drought over the next few months. And it appears as though James has found the larger version or the larger cousin of our beautiful Inyala. So let's jump on the back of his vehicle and have a look at the kudu. Yes, a larger version of the or cousin in a slightly compromised position just relieved herself there. And 
that's actually quite an interesting thing because, of course, we were talking about how the birds are able to filter water effectively and get rid of salt. You'll find that the urine of animals like kudu, which can live in very dry conditions, is extremely concentrated. And the drier it becomes, the less water dependent they are and the more concentrated their urine is. They've got an extremely specialized sort of system in their kidneys. They're very good at extracting the last bits of moisture that they need to. She's a young cow, and there are a whole lot of others the other side of the road sort of resting in the shade. And she's been particularly kind of patient and confiding with us. So often the kudu disappear into the bush where they feel comfortable, and you don't get an view of them out in the open like this. You try and compare her with the Nyala. People sometimes say, well, they get confused between the two. But if you look at them together or just after each other, you can't really confuse them. The color is different. She's a kind of gray-brown, as opposed to that rich chestnut red of the Nyala. They spend more time in the open woodland than they would in the kind of riverine, thicker stuff that the Nyala like to be in. And Cindy, you wanted to know the difference between the kudus and the nyalas. And while this is, I mean, you can't see from your screen how big she is compared with the female nyala, she, even though she's probably only about 18 months old, is already much larger than a female nyala. Female nyala was pro would probably be about mm, three quarters the size of this kudu cow. They definitely live in a different habitat type. You will sometimes find them together, but ideally these chaps like kind of woodland, uh, taller woodland than the, and not quite as thick woodland as the Nyala would like. Now look at her belly and look at the muscles on her back and you can see that she is starting to be affected, I think, by the drought. She's starting to lose a bit of condition. It's certainly not dire by any stretch of the imagination yet, but kudu can crash quite quickly because they eat leaves only, browse leaves. If the leaves start to produce too much in the way of tannins, the kudu have no option but to eat that tannin, and if they eat enough of it, it stops up the digestive system completely and they can die. So they do need to watch out. She's chewing her cud at the moment. See that rhythmical round movement of the bottom jaw. And I have to tell you, watch her throat now, watch her throat. <laughs> I don't know why I always find that so amusing to watch them kind of throw up and then re-chew it. I don't know. It just seems the most incongruous thing to do. You know how incredibly uncomfortable it is for you if you if you vomit or if you feel nauseous and that dreadful feeling when you know it's coming and the kudu and all the ruminants have to do that by default all day, every day. And so I don't think it feels quite as dreadfully unpleasant as it does for them. Now, you can hear nothing. You can hear nothing out here, except the odd call. Just the odd call of a... What is that bird calling? No, the odd call of a, of a grey go-away bird going, quah, quah. But otherwise, there's just the buzzing of a fly in my ear, the slapping on my head as I try and get rid of the fly. And the world has just gone silent in sort of terror at the building of the heat today. There's also a dragonfly of him. I, I suppose tracking a dragonfly with the camera is likely to induce nausea, isn't it? But it was hovering. Can you see it there? <laughs> there it is, that's right. <laughs> Do you know, on YouTube, you wanted to know if we get dragonflies? Well, there you go. <laughs> we do. Um, almost impossible to fill because it, ch it doesn't bank and change direction. It looks like it's going to sit on the aerial. Here it comes again. He managed to get it. Not too little. That's incredible. Here it comes again, down to the right-hand side. 
and it doesn't change direction like a bird. It somehow manages to change direction completely instantly, so you can't track it. You have no idea where it's going to go. Well done, VM. Good job. Can't really even see it on the viewpoint. No. OK, I think let's move on from here. Continue on our way. See if we can't find signs of those lions. Ah, now G.I. Jane. Oh, look at this little thing. Panicked. Little kudu. Now, that's a tiny kudu, probably only a few weeks old. And that's about the same size as a female Nyala adult. And G.I. Jane, you want the other member of the genus Tragalaphus that we get out here. And that, of course. Hello. <laughs> there's, the, there's the adult kudu with its little baby. And that, of course, is the bushbuck. Bushbuck, unusual G.I. Jane in this area. We do get them uh, much more prevalent on area, in areas where you have permanent water. Look, this is a tiny little thing. But we do find them around the camp sometimes, G.I. Jane, so when we get close to camp, we'll see if there aren't any. And a bushbuck also is easily distinguishable from the others. It doesn't have stripes. It's got kind of Bambi-like spots on it. This chap seems to have a bit of a slack jaw. Maybe when will require orthodontic treatment when it's a teenager. Dreadful time of my life, that was. Yeah, it's definitely going to require a visit to the orthodontist. See that, Vim? Mm -hmm. mm. Call him Smiley. You could call him Smiley. I wonder, in all seriousness, if that isn't an injury of some sort. He does have a, a remarkably unique look, though. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to laugh at your child. I, I do apologize. I'm cry. No, no, I think she's not crying, she's angry. Well, she is crying. Look at that. And I think that the animals out here will often be weeping from the eyes because of what they eat. So, I mean, they eat a lot of very thorny stuff. You can see those eyes are bugging her. They eat so much thorny stuff that it's inevitable that their eyes must get spiked now and then by thorns and sharp twigs. Oh, that is hilarious. I think, though, that the bottom lip of that kudu has come away slightly from the jaw. That may have been, maybe it was running away, maybe it was born like that. Maybe it was running away from something and caught the lip on a tree stump. It's also got a slightly floppy right ear. I'm not convinced that this is the, um, the most prime example of kudu, kudu hood. That's interesting. Floppy right ear and floppy lower jaw. Maybe just so young that, it, you know, those sort of neurological pathways haven't quite linked up. I don't think it can move that ear properly. That's quite sweet. It'd be nice to watch the progress of this little chap. Walking fine, absolutely fine. I'm certainly running fine just now. Be fascinating to watch what happens with it. Don't worry, Mum. Shock of the bush felt was also a runt. That's very sweet. Cool. There you go. How good, Liam? Yes. I like this look. You like this look? Mm -hmm. It's a bit disconcerting, I find, when you meet somebody with a bottom lip like that. Orthodontics, not a fun time. Okay, 
Okay, we're on the power lines. Obviously, you can see that the, we're driving past power lines. We do need to get power in, unfortunately. So while it's a slight blight on the landscape, it is unfortunately very necessary for us to bring you the broadcast that we do. And this, I mean, I I'm just kind of hoping we're gonna bump some lion tracks, or ideally a lion because there were tracks around here. We had the Kudu alarming. And there are no tracks seemingly heading out of the reserve. So they must be around here. But if they had killed something yesterday, we'd have seen vultures. There would be, have been plenty of vultures yesterday as a result of that immensely hot day that we had. The vultures would have been flying all around. And we know that the vultures are around. We saw how many there were around where that dead artfark was the other day. So I'm not sure that the lions would have killed anything in here. It's all rather a mystery. Ah, now Niggy, Iggy, when we lost us last, we were talking about the water holes uh, in the Kruger and whether I think it's a good or a bad thing. I'm not sure how far we got. But basically to say to you, I think it was somewhere around about the point where I said that the tourism is obviously a huge part of how the Kruger National Park survives. And if you just let nature take its course in an area like that, uh, you can end up with a fairly substantial die-off of animals, uh, which A, doesn't look very nice, and B, makes people not want to visit. And so I think that you'll find that while the Kruger National Park is largely a conservation organization, I think that you'll find that the decision to open up water points on the ephemeral rivers has got a lot to do with um, some tourism in imperatives, which is fine. I think that's okay. We all got to pay our way. We all got to pay our way. The land's no different, unfortunately. Right, we're going down Impala Road now towards some clearings. Well, we just hope to find something, really. A very nice general game today. Nice elephants to start with. And I know there are elephants at the Juma Pan, or there certainly were. Just are any lion tracks coming across here. I think Jamie is on her way there. Of course, when you for lions, every termite mound and every shadow seems to contain a lion until you look properly, in which case they don't. Now here's something interesting. Look at this root stock here. First of all, the strength it must have taken to push that thing out of the ground is beyond the comprehension of you and I, and certainly even a bulldozer would struggle to do that. So that was an elephant that pushed that over. And then he's pushed it over for a specific reason. You can see he's eaten the roots off. The roots are obviously very nutritious, and an elephant, especially in a drought or dry time, I think this is actually pushed over in the winter, uh, will eat those and chew on the cambium layer of the roots, which will in turn give them a whole lot of nutrition. And largely because in the, ca in the roots, the, the roots are kind of a storage facility for the plants, and so they will store a lot of the carbohydrates made in the leaves. They will store there in the roots, and that's obviously a very rich source of food. The sun is unbelievably bright already. Until she gets there. We'll see what else we can find in this clearing. Maybe a cheetah. That would be nice. Fluffy cheetah. I want a fluffy cheetah, as opposed to a bald one. Yes. Uh, crabby one. Never seen a bald cheetah, have you, Vian? Mm -hmm. No. Heard of a albino one. Ah. I'm just checking again to see if those lion tracks have perhaps come across here, but I don't see any signs of them. So I'm deeply confused as to where they have gone. And here's some parrots. 
Okay, here's also something quite interesting. Quite interesting. It's not, it's not overwhelmingly fascinating, but it's quite interesting. We often get the question is what comes first, the termite mound or the tree? Because, of course, lots of termite mounds have trees growing out of them. And an interesting thing I saw yesterday was a fallen over knobthorn with a um, termite mound growing over the top of it. And I think... Normally, I would have said that it, it was the termite mound that came first. Termites drag the seed underground. It's very fertilized there, and so they germinate and grow. I'm not convinced that's the case here. I think that this, that's a very ancient Combretum colinum bush there, in there. And I think that this termite mound has grown up around it. I think the other bush next to it has come out of it on the right-hand side. I think that's grown out of the termite mound. But I think that that Combretum tree has been there probably hundreds of years. Very thick, being broken off hundreds of times. Some parrots, as I said, pulling up ahead, brown-headed parrots. It's always kind of incongruous seeing a parrot out here. Let's see if we can spot one of you. All right, Jamie's with the elephants. Our signal's a bit shaky. Let's go across to her. We'll see you across there, too. Brian and myself have rushed away from Buffels of Dam, which is where I was checking, to come and see if we can catch up with this elephant herd that was drinking at Juma Pan. We just missed them. They've gone down into the drainage line. You can see a couple of them feeding around there. We'll go forward slightly so we've got a better view. And the reason that, well, one of the reasons, apart from the fact that I love elephants, one of the reasons that we rushed across here was because we have the virtual reality rig on the vehicle. So I was hoping that we might get some nice shots of them at the same time. They're all moving through some very dense vegetation. There's one hiding at the back there. large elephant herd, finished having their drink, and now hiding in the drainage line in the shade. Good place to be, and plenty of food around, plenty of shelter from the sun, which already is baking hot, even at this early hour of the morning. It is going to be unbelievably warm. I'm just going to try and see if I can get a better view from further ahead. I look for a nice gap in the bush. I can hear them. And I know that there is a nice road that takes us in here. exactly where they're going to pop out if they do decide to come up this side. Hello, Ellie's. Oh, little one. Pretty certain this is the same herd that James had a magical sighting with yesterday and this morning briefly, and that I had a really lovely sighting with as well the day before that. Look at the little baby hiding behind mom. And at that age, under a year, Going to need plenty, the herd's going to be stopping plenty of times to let the little ones sleep and relax. They need a lot of rest to cope with all the growing they've got to do over the next few months. And that first year of an elephant's life is when they do the most rapid part of their growth. And that continues on for 
about 10 years, getting slower and slower as they grow, but they will continue to grow for the rest of their lives. Ducking into the shade there. Is that large female? Really certain that that's her? Ah, oh, I know you. Oh, goodness gracious, are you causing trouble, Mister? He's about to push that tree over. Here's our friend, the elephant with the hole in his ear, and a occasionally dis disgruntled temperament. He's had a bit of a to do with that female, and he's now showing off by pushing the tree over. He's heard us now, and he's keeping an eye on us. I think he's trying to decide whether he wants to stay with the ladies or come and investigate us. I'm going to bop his head against the tree, just to show how big and scary he is. And in this case, he is. He is fairly correct in that assumption. And that's probably what's stressed this. Look at the elephant there showing her distress with her right foot. Oh no, she's actually just kicking up sand. I thought she was a bit disgruntled with him, but she's not. She's just having a dust bath, but keeping a close eye on him nonetheless. I don't know if he's going into must. He looks as though he is. He's secreting from his temporal glands. And he has been showing the odd tendency. This is the same elephant that decided to come and say hello in a very physical way to the front of Scott's vehicle. Come on, boy. You're going to push that whole tree over. Thinking about it. Look at that. Summing it up. Whoa. Almost on, almost on the baby. Now that is a serious display of strength. That very, very nearly landed on that youngster. Poor little thing. And that's why females get disgruntled and unhappy when males are in the area. Little one moving out of the way. Has he done that to come and feed? I don't think so. I don't think that had anything to do with getting any nutrition. It was just to show everybody how big and strong he is. I wouldn't be surprised if he isn't the one that threw the tantrum. She's backing in. How was that display of strength? Wasn't that absolutely incredible? That was a knobthorn tree. It's one of the most solid trees that we have out here. It's thick, dense, hard wood. Just, just second to that of leadwood. About a cubic meter of that wood weighs 800 kilograms, so just under a ton. Over 1,600 pounds. And he just pushed it over like it was nothing. He gathered a little bit of momentum and then shoved it over. Little one taking advantage of it now. Have a snack of the leaves at the top. I'm just trying to have a good sniff, see if I can smell if he's coming in properly into must yet or not. Elephant's perfectly calm. That's him standing at the back there on the left. And then a female and her youngster. I'm not imagining things. There is a slight uneasiness to the female's body language. Backing into him like that is a sign, can be a sign of supplication. And a, the presence of a big male like this can change the character of an elephant herd completely. They can go from the wonderfully relaxed elephants that we've been witnessing over the last two days and become stressed out and unhappy, and you can see why when a big male like that nearly pushes a tree on top of your baby. 
I don't think that's what he was intending. I think he was showing off. It wasn't targeting the baby in any way. But it really nearly did come down on top of it, exactly where the baby was getting down to go rest. The crack of that tree. Here you go, girl. Having had a drink, it's now time for another dust bath. Apparently, we're having a discussion with James earlier about elephants' body language, and I'm keeping quite a close eye on what's happening here with this herd, including the distress of the female. And she was, she's relaxing a bit now, but she was rocking backwards and forwards, which is very often a sign that they are unhappy. I know James was discussing it in the context of the presence of the vehicle, but it applies across the board. They, their body cues are essentially for each other, and we just have to learn how to read that language. And Sharon, who's watching in Pittsburgh, Sharon was, Sharon was wondering, well, surely the tail is also an indicator of mood. She's noticed that when elephants are a bit upset, their tails sort of become slightly stiffer and sit halfway up. And Sharon, it's one of the most important indicators of mood. I've spoken before about bulls that I've approached on foot. It was actually one of my, the first time I ever observed it was one of my training walks. And we were approaching a, a male elephant many years ago. And the trainer said to us, at first he was completely unaware of us. And without any major visible change, the elephant didn't stop, it didn't turn around and look at us, it carried on feeding, but his tail went completely still. And the trainer said, right, he's, he's heard us, he knows we're here. He's aware of our presence. Now, the tails can be an indicator of lots of different things. They usually sway gently from side to side when they're relaxed and feeding. There's a whole load of eddies coming through now. I'm gonna go forward a little bit just to change our perspective on things. Oh, sorry, Brian. Oh, there's a little one down there as well. One of the, the second youngster from this herd. So Sharon, yes, and when they get excited or really upset, their tail stiffens and it sits at sort of 90 degrees to their bodies. And it's a very good indication that you've got an upset elephant on your hands, whether it's due to your presence or something that's happening within the herd itself. She's pushing up underneath this dead tree to try and get at the green shoots below. The baby's gonna try and take advantage of it at the same time. Stapping her air, con air conditioning units already. Those large ears with all their network of blood vessels to help keep an animal of this size cool in the African summer heat is no small task. That's why the ear system is such a clever way of cooling them down. One of the cheeky youngsters at the back. And I mentioned that, here he's sweeping in dust. I mentioned that um, the elephants, will, when they're younger, will lie down to rest fairly regularly. There you go. Somebody's fallen asleep there, right next to the big bull. So obviously, the bull is not considered to be too much of a threat to them. He's fast asleep. And generally, males are not a threat. They get a bit pushy, they get a bit boisterous especially if there's a female in estrus. But for the most part, they'll never set out to deliberately hurt. Look, there's two of them there. I'm sure that that's, there's two, there's two eddies lying there. The little one lying next to the bigger one. That's so cute. 
up again. Obviously can't find a comfortable spot. Oh, <laughs> trying to climb over that one's legs to curl up next to its stomach. Or possibly just stand up, which appears to be a bit of a struggle. I'm going to clamber on it. Bonds between elephant cousins and siblings. It could be that those two are siblings. Either way, they will be related to some extent. Incredibly firm. Curling up next to it. I'm trying to work out if there's a better view for us. I don't think so. I think we've got the gap there. Oh, stretching out over the top. Doesn't really get much sweeter than that. Can't quite get that comfy spot it's looking for. <laughs> the older elephant just fast asleep, being completely tolerant of the attentions of the younger one. Oh, let me try a bit further. Let me try a little bit on that side, maybe closer to your head. And baby elephants, as a general rule, are also a little bit more flexible than the adults. They have a slightly wider range of motion, as you see with most mammals. Kids are like that as well, toddlers. <laughs> Trying to find a way of making the front legs a nice pillow. And it's just not quite working out. Oh, there we go, fine. The dirt will do. Now there's a tree in the way. Oh, goodness. Life is tough when you're a baby elephant. Oh, done. <laughs> I give up. <laughs> I give up. I think I'm just going to sleep here. No, no, actually, I'm not comfortable there either. Now I can't quite get up because gravity is not in my favour. Oh. All I want to do is have a nap. It's like an overtired toddler. <laughs> now that it's Trying to, still trying to decide where the best position is. Maybe the shoulder will do. Nope, because I keep sliding off. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> oh goodness, this is just not going this little one's way. I actually feel most sorry for the poor elephant trying to snooze underneath it. Oh, little one, is everything very tough? Everything's a bit mountainous when you've got tiny little, relatively tiny little legs. Right, I'm going to sleep on your face now. That is where I want to be. I'm going to sit on your nose. Nope, that's not right either. Okay, let's try the shoulder again. <laughs> the elephant had enough now. Drawing the line and sitting on his face. <laughs> that was almost a full backward somersault. <laughs> no, I've had it. I I love you, but you may not sleep on my head. Poor little thing. All we was trying to do was find a comfy spot. We got very unceremoniously shrugged off. I wouldn't be surprised if these two are siblings. The bond with the mom in elephants persists. Oh, 
cute. Now, now it wants to steal whatever that poor elephant's eating. The bond with the mother persists even after she's had her next calf, particularly if it is females. And young elephants learn from babysitting. They learn, young females learn how to be mothers from babysitting their younger siblings and their younger cousins. It's known as allo mothering. So the same as allo grooming or allo suckling, allo mothering is something that is very common in elephant herds. And elephant herds are, the, the babies are crucial to maintaining the bonds. There you go, look at that. Gentle stroke with the trunk from mommy. Mommy, I tried to have a nap and it just couldn't get comfortable and now I'm overtired and I think I'm hungry and please just love me. full of tail there. Imagine the perspective of a baby elephant in the middle of the elef of an elephant herd. It's just legs everywhere. Legs and tails and trunks. While our baby Ellie is hidden behind mommy's legs, James has found another much fluffier baby to show you. Well, it seems to be not only uh, Women's Day, but um, Baby's Day. A very s small group, or two little tiny uh, water buck. Sorry, the game drive radio is exploding in my ear here. There we go, now I can concentrate. And they look like little donkeys, as you can see. And their mothers are nowhere to be seen. And this is, of course, the strategy of Kudu and Waterbuck out here. They'll leave their little babies hidden. You can see how beautifully camouflaged and cleverly colored they are. They'll leave their little youngsters in the thickets, and then they'll go off and have their drinks, perhaps have to go and find some other grazing, which is a bit further afield than this and then they'll come back and suckle these fellows. And they will have, they will sort of go to ground and stand up only if they really feel threatened. Uh, actually, I'm talking nonsense. That is the strategy, but there is a female around here. Um, can you see, brilliantly colored is the water buck for this kind of vegetation. Just to the right-hand side, there's a cow there. Anyway, there are the little ones. They will still be suckling almost completely. All right, let's go back to Jamie. It looks like that herd might move off, and we'll continue north up the cheetah cut line. Poor baby just settled down and was just about to go to sleep when these two naughty boys disturbed it once again. They're having a little bit of a fight, like they were yesterday. Hormones and tempers running a little bit high. And they just caused absolute chaos. But then the amazing thing was actually what Brian pointed out afterwards. Oh, 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 tantrum. Proper tantrum there. What's got into you lot? Head banging, quite literally, against the tree. But yes, what Brian actually pointed out was the way after there was that big panic, because all of the elephants got a fright as the elephants ran, as the young males ran past. But every elephant went completely quiet. And I'm sure that the matriarch, or one of the higher ranking females, was actually rumbling to them. I couldn't hear it. It's, sub-frequency was below my hearing. It definitely upset them tremendously and she was comforting them and relaxing them and quite possibly even telling them to behave themselves. All on the move again. Yeah, 
Here's our little one at the back. Shame it had just, just finally found a spot in the dirt that seemed comfortable. And sleep was imminent. And then chaos erupted. Lots of branches breaking and cracking. Somebody is now wearing a tree briefly. Oh no, just sliding underneath it. It's a stunning view of them. Oh, I didn't realize. Look at that. Lady's got a collar on her. I don't remember seeing that in my elephant herd that I had the other day. Here you go, sitting in the top of her back between her shoulders and her forehead and then dangling down in front of her is a radio collar. So somebody's researching this herd, tracking, probably tracking their movements, building up a bit of a map of where they come and they go. And that collar is complete, does not interfere with her in any way. It doesn't bother the other elephants, it doesn't bother her. The only thing is that its batteries will have to be changed every now and again. And you'll probably find that that emits both a radio frequency as well as over the last few years with the technology improvements will send out a GPS signal of the position of the herd. Every, either every twice a day or once a day, depending on how quickly they want to change the batteries. <clears throat> and what they'll do when they pick an elephant to pop that collar on is generally they'll choose a high-ranking female, so one of the older females that's almost guaranteed to be with the herd the whole time, but not necessarily the matriarch. And now, thanks to the male elephant that pushed that enormous knob thorn over, they've all gathered for a snack the new shoots and leaves that have the best access to the sun crowding around it. Now he has done them a favor, ultimately. Lots of bottoms. I've been watching them. Before they started feeding, all of the herd members were enjoying the loose sand and the ability to have a quick a dust bath. And Lucy was wondering, why is it that they dust bath? What is it that they find so enjoyable about that? If we're lucky, this female might even decide to do it. Are you gonna do it, girl? Sorry, it was Lisa, roll on me who asked the question, who's watching on YouTube. And the answer is one, generally it helps to scratch certain itches that they might have. So despite what people may say, elephants don't necessarily not have parasites. So they may have ticks in the softer areas. Their skin is not really too thick in parts. Also, I think they do it quite honestly. I think they do it because it feels nice. I think they like the feeling of it flowing over them. It's also a way of coating themselves in a fine layer of sand, which helps to just mitigate the effect of the harsh sun. They do the same thing with mud, as you can see on the back of that female. She's managed to get mud all along the top of her back, probably by throwing it up over her with her trunk. So Lisa, it, generally, I think they enjoy the feeling. And it's got a couple of other purposes as well. The reason, I've just been listening to a whole flock of ox pickers fly past. The reason that if elephants do carry ticks, that they do not have ox pickers sitting on them, is because with that incredibly flexible trunk and their distaste for having anything touching them, or crawling and hopping over them, any ox picker that does try to alight on the back of an unsuspecting elephant will find itself potentially faced with a very effective bird swatter. And they turn around and they twist and they flick with their trunks and they scare them away. I've seen it happen a few times where an ill-advised ox picker has decided to descend 
And the elephant has reacted instantly by taking a very rapid swing at it. But they just don't like it. They just don't allow it to happen. Look, they're all crowding around that knob thorn. And yes, evidence right before our eyes. Elephants push down trees, that's what they do. But we're going to be seeing it more and more. They're going to be targeting certain vegetation types. And there'll be a difference, a minor difference maybe, but a difference nonetheless to the shape of the landscape by the time this drought is done. Most of them trying to get as much as they can before it gets too hot. So Peggy's raised a good point about that collared female. Peggy said, won't it be traumatic for them to take the collar off and change the batteries? And Peggy, yes, it is to an extent. It is traumatic, not just for the elephant, but for the entire herd. And what it involves, because you cannot do it any other way, is putting the elephant under anesthetic. So it is done and used very sparingly. And the research that comes from it is used to benefit the elephant population as a whole. The trauma does occur, but it is brief. And once she is back up and running with her herd, and that, that is after, it's a very, very quick process. They'll dart her, she'll go to sleep. They'll change the collar as quickly as possible, immediately give her a reversal drug, and she'll be back up on her feet in possibly even, and I've seen it done in less than an hour, once the elephant was found and darted. So a very brief moment, she probably wakes up feeling a little bit groggy, maybe like she's had a bit of a ha has a bit of a hangover and the elephant herd does get that's why many elephant herds do not like helicopters apart from the buzzing above them and a very loud buzzing it's not a, not equatable to the drone so it is traumatic but it is worth it in terms of the value that it presents in terms of scientific research and being able to use it in a way that benefits the species and in conservation in general as a whole in terms of how often it needs to be done it depends on what the collar is being used for. So if it's sending out GPS signals four times a day, it'll be needed to be changed more frequently than if it's sending it out once a day. Generally, my experience with them is that the batteries will last about a year and a half to two years before needing to be changed. And then they will fly over and dart the elephant in question. You might even find, Peggy, that it's just a brief it's a, it's a once-off stint with the collar. Well, it seems unlikely because animals like elephants are so long-lived that the research and our understanding of them is constantly growing and expanding. The reason that they do not dart the matriarch and put a collar on the matriarch is that once the matriarch is darted in that scenario, the rest of the elephants go into a flat, leaderless panic and they don't leave the darted elephants, so researchers can't get to her quick enough to be able to put the collar on. And that's because as the matriarch, she would be the one leading them and giving them direction. Whereas if they take a high-ranking female and they dart her, the matriarch will immediately lead her family away to safety. And they will be able to get the process done as quickly as possible. Go forward a bit, those boys are having a scuffle again. And just by the way, poor little baby has finally managed to go to sleep. Oh, no, up again, poor thing. The boy is having a tussle. Hormones raging. And you'll probably find that the presence of the bull also encourages them. And sitting with chatting about the leadership of the matriarch. Don't forget that this afternoon will be a special International Women's Day. And of course, I, I mention that in the context of Ellie's due to their strong matriarchal system. So don't forget, ladies out there, you can send through your wish lists of which animals you would like to see. Obviously, within reason, I can't promise you a tiger or a gray wolf or a blue whale but animals that you would like to see on our live safari. 
as well as any inspirational ladies that you would like to send out a message to or shout out to or draw attention to. And slowly, slowly, looks as though they might decide to... Oh! So that is exactly where the poor little baby was trying to have a sleep. Keeps getting coated in dust, but that's for Lisa. Clearly enjoying herself there, throwing dust all over herself. Remarkable how versatile those trunks really are. Anything from pulling down trees or pushing down trees, in the case of what that bull did, to throwing dust across them. And I think if we sit peacefully here, there's a good chance this elephant herd might slowly wander across the drainage line towards us. There we go, there's some coming through now. It's like a young female having a munch. Somebody hiding there in the back. Isn't that amazing how well that camouflage works? Have you spotted the elephant? You'll see it with the odd ear flap. There we go. That elephant is not that far away from us. It's completely hidden. Here we go, now we can see you. And across to the marula trees. Let's see if those two are still sparring and if I can get you a nicer view of it. Young bulls, all reaching their teenage stages and taking out their pent up frustrations on each other and their surrounding environment. I must say, that tantrum that the one had where he bashed the other trees with his head was quite hilarious. It was the equivalent of a teenage, teenager slamming their bedroom door. his trunk around, actually sniffing to see whether or not he wants to eat from there. It's not going to be all that edible. I can hear, I can hear tusks clashing. I want to work out where it's coming from. When you see them clash like that and you hear the sound that their tusks make against each other, and then you remember that tusks are actually modified teeth. You can understand how they get broken. Try and roll forward. Oh, no, don't have enough momentum. Let's see what's happening on this side. And there's a quite nice view of the young males. You gonna get up to anything? <laughs> it's gonna get a little bit too hot for them to want to do that. Here's the rest of the herd. Let's go forward a little bit. I also want to give myself plenty of room in this dense environment to actually be able to back out if the bull does decide to come through. Just because he's displayed some temperamental moments in the past. Although I think he's far more distracted by the elephant herd. Yeah, the 
munching away. Oh, Brian, it's getting warm, eh? Hey? No. Sure. Break, yeah. So, Cara, who's watching in YouTube, would like to know how does the matriarch get picked in an elephant herd? And the answer is generally it is one of the oldest, biggest, well, automatically biggest, but one of the oldest females that takes up the role. And quite often, what will happen is when she dies, when she gets to the point of being slightly infirm, um, so that she's no longer fully up to the job of, sorry, I'm blinking straight into the sun, no longer up to the job of leading her family, then her, quite often her daughter will step in, her oldest daughter will step in and take over. Or her sister, if she's got a sister close in age or a cousin close in age. It depends very much on the dynamics of each individual elephant herd. A lot of the time it's a daughter that takes over, but sometimes it could be another individual elephant that steps in. And you'll find that each elephant has different personalities and quite often the matriarch has a very calming, protective feel to her and very solid direction and leadership. Whereas her, a, a female of similar age, but not quite the matriarch, so quite a, a highly ranked within the herd or highly respected. It's not really a rank in an elephant herd, but she'll often take on the role of either aggressor or, or serious protector. So she'll be the first to put herself between a threat and her family whilst the matriarch tries to lead them away. And she'll, sometimes what they'll do is that the sort of second in command female will walk ahead of the herd and the matriarch will walk at the back or vice versa. So they develop their own characters and their own strategies depending on each individual. And I definitely think of, very much think of elephants as individuals with their own personalities and their own characters. Maybe not to the same degree of humans, but they definitely, definitely have their individual characteristics. I'm going to try and see if I can get another view. This hasn't been the best position. Let's try and go back a little bit. Here we go. That's slightly better. The males at the back have finally had their chance to come and feed on the knob thorn. And you know what? Sorry, I'm in the car a little bit. Shame. It's tough being a young male elephant. You get to the stage where you went from a beloved calf to a less beloved teenage boy. And the herd just doesn't quite treat you the same way anymore. And you're almost an outsider. That and combined with your instincts that are telling you that it's time for you, it's going to be time for you to move off on your own. And the little one has finally managed nap time. It's very difficult for you to see. It's hidden between the legs of the adults at the back there. You can barely see it, but that little form sleeping there is the baby elephant that's finally managed to have a nap. There you can sort of see a leg moving every now and again. Eventually, at least somebody managed to have a quick nap. Mom. Mom and sisters and cousins and aunts forming a protective circle around it as they sleep. And she'll quite happily, they'll actually quite happily stand there for hours on end protecting the baby. Not hours, that's a slight exaggeration, but they'll, they'll let the baby sleep for half an hour, 45 minutes, up to an hour before they rouse them and wake them up. found herself, looks like, oh, stripping the leaves away. That was all she wanted. Oh, shame, little baby. Up again. I've also seen baby elephants throw temper tantrums when they get woken up, squealing in fury, in, in indignation that anybody should dare to stir them from their slumber.
Now there's exciting news for this afternoon, something that's come through on the Game Drive channel, and that is the fact that the wild dogs were on Cheetah Plains at some point this morning at three in the row pan. And given the distance that a wild dog can cover, as our regular viewers know, that could mean that they are with us by the afternoon for the sunset safari. That would be very exciting. I've missed wild dogs. It's been a while since I've seen them. I'm also hoping that that male lion is still somewhere on the property. I got slightly distracted by the elephant herd. Look at all of the vegetation on this elephant's back. She's covered in twigs, twigs and branches. This is a very peaceful elephant herd now. Trunk curling away. And the adults will take the opportunity, whilst the youngsters are resting, to feed a little bit and then doze themselves. And the elephants don't need huge amounts of sleep, but they can sleep, and they do sleep. They have babies more than adults, but they'll doze for 20 minutes at a time. I've seen them doze with their heads up against marula trees or with their trunks resting in marula trees to take the weight off them a little bit. And when they do sleep, I've found some very, very much asleep, in deep sleep. And even adult, an adult can lie down if they want to, generally resting up against a bank or a termite mound or a tree. And as we draw to the end of our sunrise safari, it's us head over to James Hendry so that he can bid you a final farewell and tell you what he's been up to. Monkeys, hooray, we have a little bit of signal. Sorry, everybody, for our prolonged absence. Uh, look, we haven't found anything particularly spectacular, but we have now found some monkeys in a jackalberry tree just above the Juma Dam. Anyway, they have gone away, and we did find a bushbuck. G.I. Jane, we found you a bushbuck. Unfortunately, Wendy didn't feel like showing it to, her, showing it to you. Nasty vehicle. Anyway, we did find one. It uh, sends its best regards, G.I. Jane, and hopes to see you at another time. Uh, we're going to leave you now, Viam. Thank you for your efforts today. Well done. That's Viam's rather long thumb, considering his, his, his stature, actually. It's, a, it's an impressively lengthed thumb. A big thank you to the final control of Jerry and Louise and Kirsten, and then Jamie, just down the drainage line here with some elephants, and Brian. We leave you in their capable care for the rest of the drive and see you this afternoon at four o'clock. Bye-bye. The young boy is back together once again. And it's always fascinating to watch them come up to each other because they do exactly what this youngster on the left is doing, which is stick their trunks in each other's mouths. All elephants do it, but you see it very commonly in young males. Ah, there's, there you go, there again. It's not really to go and steal food out of the elephant's mouth, it's to smell, <clears throat> it's to smell, to explore and to investigate. Look at that, having a good sniff. I have seen them though steal food out of another elephant's mouth. It was very funny to watch. Very close bonds of these elephant bulls. He's a bit larger than the other two. In the next few years, he's going to be facing that traumatic moment. And there's a time coming for him to move on. Well, this has been a really lovely elephant sighting. I've really enjoyed it. There's nothing, I've said this before, there's a couple of them coming up through there as well. I've said this before, but there's nothing that actually transmits the sense of peace that an elephant sighting like this can give you. I know that James feels exactly the same way, and I'm sure all of our viewers do as well. Thank you, as always, to all of you for joining us, and a big thank you to Brian for his wonderful camera work, and to Jerry and Kirsty in final control. Ladies and gentlemen, have a wonderful day. Don't forget to join us for International Women's Day this afternoon. 
and we will catch you then for the sunset safari and who knows what wondrous things that afternoon may hold. Bye-bye and have a wonderful day.